All right, here we go. As most of you guys know who watch the show, we refer to our Knicks fan OGs as the people who have seen the Knicks, all the glory days, all the great moments from the championships on down. And uh, that is my guest today. His name is Fred Cantor, a season ticket holder of the Knicks since the 87 season, lifelong Knicks fan since, I guess, the 60s, right, Fred? About the yes, 60s. that's right. Yeah, exactly. And he wrote a memoir called Fred from Fresh Meadows, a memoir of a Knicks fan. So joining me today is Fred Cannon. Fred, thanks again for joining me. How, how's everything going? CP, thanks so much for, for having me on. You know how much I enjoy seeing uh, your shows, your taped interviews, and your post-game wrap-ups. Uh, so thanks again for having me on. Yeah, thank you, and, and thanks for your support. So what, uh, what sparked you to, to uh, draft this memoir? Well, it started with uh, the pandemic uh, because uh, like a lot of people my age and stage, my underlying health conditions, I was uh, at home, instructed by my doctor not even to go into stores. Uh, so I'm stuck at home and I was looking for something to transport me to somewhere else. And I figured, you know what? I, how much I love the Knicks. Uh, I would love to do some I, I basically have worked on past projects where I've done research. I've worked on a couple of documentaries, a photo history book, and I love doing online research. And I figured what better thing than to do about my experiences with the Knicks, which I realized would also require me to have the very tough job of looking at old games on tape. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that got me totally immersed and it really did transport me. Days would fly by, I had no idea what was going on. I was so caught up in it, so it was perfect. And the next thing that happened was I was putting it together and this was really just for myself. I thought there was something shaping up there. So mm -hmm. I shared it with uh, uh, some friends, a couple of whom are published writers. And they said, you know what, Fred, you've got something here that really could have appeal to a broader audience. You know, you should take a yeah. stab at it. So um, that led me to, you know, think about trying to line up a publisher, which, as you know, is an extremely uh, uphill Definitely. battle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, I got this idea. I saw this relatively new website called the Strickland, which mm -hmm. I know you're familiar oh, yeah, with. Yeah, shout out to got Alex it, got, and Schweeney and those guys. Right. For sure got uh, uh, editor-in-chief uh, Alex Wolf, you know, and other guys who worked at various other uh, websites and podcasts and publications like SI. And uh, I saw the quality of the writing they did, and I approached Alex. And I said, hey, I, I have this next memoir. Um, I'd like to do this as a complete charity project mm -hmm. with all the royalties going to the John Starks Foundation, mm -hmm. which, uh, as you may know, he has had this for more than a quarter century. Mm -hmm. And he uh, uh, helps finance scholarships for kids in need uh, who also are very active in the community and are good students. So that's a great cause yeah. that I embrace. And I went to Alex and I said, uh, if you really like the, the manuscript, you know, how about publishing it under the, the Strickland? We could do it through KDP Amazon, which is print on demand. Mm -hmm. And uh, we could get it in the marketplace very quickly than going through a traditional uh, publishing uh, company. And um, Alex read it, he loved it. And he said, this is a great idea, you know, let's roll with it. So <laughs> Fred from Fresh Meadows and Nick's memoir became the, the very first nice. book of the Strickland Press. And uh, all the royalties, as I said, are directly earmarked going to the foundation. So that's nice. how it went from a personal project to something you know, for the for for a charity. Yeah, yeah, very very interesting to see how it evolved. You know, and and six decades of memories. I always say that there's no better storyteller from a fan perspective than than a Knicks fan. No doubt about it. From the thrill of victory, agony of defeat, and then you know, once again, donating the um, the proceeds to the John Starks Foundation. Very commendable feat for sure. Thank you. And um, and you know what I found in doing this was. Um, the, and, and by the way, mm -hmm. uh, obviously this was published uh, ju uh, just before the season started. We had we had no idea what was about to take place. So mm -hmm. I did write, and this is in the book, I saw what was happening now as having parallels to the 60s when mm -hmm. I grew up. Because, um, you know, people say, geez, you know, how bad can things get? Well, mm -hmm. let me tell you how bad things could bet, can get. I did not see a, a Knicks team with a winning record until I was in ninth grade. Mm -hmm. They missed the playoffs seven years in a row when, at a time when basically there was one team in what was then known as the Eastern Division that didn't qualify. <laughs> so th th things were actually worse in, in some ways. Yeah. 
And, uh, but, but, you know, the thing is, um, unlike uh, some sport leading uh, TV personalities who shall remain nameless, you know, you learn yeah. to stick with the team through thick and thin. Yeah. And what happened in the 60s was that they started drafting, getting good draft picks, mm-hmm. starting with Willis Reed. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying that anyone on the team right now is the equal of Willis Reed, but what I saw happening, uh, you know, recently is, you know, with, with R.J. Barrett, I mean, I felt this way before the season started, with mm-hmm. R.J. Barrett and with Mitch, uh, and I still believe in Frank, <laughs> um, I, you know, I saw a foundation being put in place similar to what happened in, in, in the 60s. And also before the season started, I really felt uh, Julius Randle had more upside than he mm. showed last year. I'm not here to tell you I felt he was going to be this, this dominant. Yeah, but, yeah. But, I, but, but I felt the foundation was being put in place. And so I felt there really was one of the joys back then was seeing the, the players develop and the team come together. And mm-hmm. I felt that's what we could see going forward. And, and it has happened big time yeah, this year. Big time. And it's been a pleasure to see, you know, certainly surpassing, uh, far surpassing expectations. So uh, fourth seed in the East as we record this interview. So hopefully they keep it up. In in, in literature and in, in writing, you know, it's said that when, when authors are doing their research, they usually come across that, that wow moment when they're doing their research, that factoid or something that they find extraordinary or, or very interesting. You writing your memoir, what, what was that for you? Well, um, and again, I, I've been a, a fan for six decades. Um, and, you know, they're obviously you forget certain things over, mm-hmm. over, over six decades. But, you know, I was going back to when Bill Bradley became the, um, the quote unquote savior for the Knicks. Mm-hmm. And for those who don't remember, he was an enormous college star at Princeton, led them to the Final Four. He scored on the U.S. Olympic team. And um, he took two years off to go to Oxford for Rhodes Scholarship. Then he had to serve some time in the National Guard. So he was joining the Knicks in December of 1967 after the season started. And uh, this was like one of the biggest things to hit the team in years. And so naturally, you know, I'm looking at all the research and it said that they were expecting a sellout. Well, of course, why wouldn't they be expecting a sellout? But but this was the, the wow moment. The crowd they said that ordinarily came at that point in time would have been 6,000 people. And from Bill Bradley showing up, it went from 6,000 to whatever the capacity was at the old garden, 18,000 plus. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, you know, I totally forgot about that. The house. So then I looked it up. In the 20 year history of the team, mm-hmm. Prior to uh, the 67, 68 season when Bill Bradley joined, there was a grand total of four sellouts in Knicks history. Four sellouts. Now, look at what's happened in all the recent years when the team hasn't played that well, Mm -hmm. or had, I should say, you know, the record hasn't been that good. You get sellout after sellout after sellout. But in the 20 years leading up to Bill Bradley's rookie season, they had a grand total of only four four sellouts. So that for me, uh, and, and again, I, I lived through that era, so I was shocked to see that. Marquee attraction, man. Definitely. Dollar Bill, one of the key pieces of that 70s championship team. Absolutely. Now, also in the memoir that I loved that you did was you, you were able to connect various events in your life, personal stories in your life, to moments in, in Nick's history. Can you, can you tell us one of those stories? Sure. Um, I think all of us as Knicks fans find that different points in our life, well, or that conflict of interest, you might say, where <laughs> there's some important family event or something else going on where, geez, if you go do that, it's going to interfere with the, with the next game you want to see. Mm-hmm. Well, the first conflict for me came when I was in high school. Um, and I was a serious student. I, I was very, I loved school and, and you know, I was uh, planning to apply to, to colleges, to some of the top colleges. Mm-hmm. So the SATs were, were happening. And that was obviously a big thing. And that Friday night before the Saturday morning, of the SATs, the Knicks were playing in game four of the NBA finals. This is the 1970 finals against the Lakers. And unlike today where they have, you know, reasonable start times for a national audience, none of that existed. The, the, the game three on a Wednesday night happened at 11 o'clock start right. time for New York wasn't even broadcast on national TV. It was, it was on Channel 9. And my parents let me stay up for that, provided that I watched the second half in bed, which, mm. which I did. So game four was starting at 10 o'clock, which 
think about it. If I were to stay up and watch that with the SATs next, you know, the most important thing for the SATs is they say, get a good night's sleep. Mm -hmm. And my parents were pretty big disciplinarians, but I was amazed. They said, you can stay up, but again, you got to watch the second half of bed. And I'm sure most parents at that time, even kids taking it would say, what are you out of your mind? Yeah. <laughs> You're going <laughs> to stay up late the night before the SATs. Mm -hmm. But I did. And um, unfortunately, the Knicks uh, lost in overtime. It went to overtime. Yeah. Uh, that that was on the, the Jerry West uh, buzzer beater, right? Was that, that on the West Belgium Game three. Game that three. Was game okay. Three, uh, which I stayed up for. It, and I have to just tell you about that. Yeah. I was admittedly getting a bit groggy because it was after one in the morning watching this. Mm. And when that shot went in, I mean, <laughs> I jumped. Up. I thought I was dreaming. Mm -hmm. That's how crazy it was. But uh, yeah, that was game three. It jolted me alert. Thankfully, the Knicks won that game. And thankfully, there was no three point line in effect then. That, that 70s team, you know, given the backdrop of everything that was happening around the world, uh, what did that team mean for you, you know, given all, this, all the current events and all the circumstances going on? Well, and, and I was very interested in, in, in current events and politics. I, I, I was raised by my parents that way uh, because I am Jewish uh, and my father faced a great deal of anti-Semitism in the workplace. And as a kid growing up, uh, you know, he, he made me very conscious and both, both my mom and dad about, mm. you know, treat people, you know, based on who they are. And, and, and they got very interested and got me interested in the civil rights movement when I was very young. So mm. I followed everything uh, through the 60s, and the Knicks um, were really, in a way, uh, uh, in part a distraction. Uh, in fact, uh, game five of the 1970 finals happened on the very day of the Kent State shooting. Kent State, right. So yeah. on the one hand, you know, you're all concerned about that, you know, but on the other hand, and I hate to say this, you know, from the selfish interest of the Knicks, I'm caught up in the Knicks, mm -hmm. you know, I want to want to see them win, but... You know, the, the other thing in terms of, and Bill Bradley has talked about this, that the Knicks served as a, as a model of the way the world could be. Because you have players, you know, not only black and white, you have players who are urban, rural, different parts of the country who came together as a team. And all of New York embraced them. Absolutely. It was like a melting pot indeed. And uh, going to, to, well, you know what? Another instrumental figure of that group was Marv Albert. You know, when I came up into the game and Marv was on the 90s NBA and NBC and, and still a very, um, you know, integral piece of, of that Knicks history, even the Ewing Knicks and, and how he told stories and how he, you know, brought out the, the emotions of the garden. You know, Marv was every bit a piece of that. But, you know, a lot of the OGs like yourself go back to Marv really in his prime being in the 70s and calling it for that Nick team. Uh, talk about Marv's impact on your fandom, just hearing the games on TV, watching on TV and hearing it on radio. It really was radio. Um, uh, back then, there really was no cable TV to speak of. I think it started in the late 60s, maybe, but in a very small area of Manhattan. But I was out in Connecticut at that point. My parents had moved to Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And the only way you could follow Nick's home games was on radio. Uh, there were no, there was no televised broadcast, and it was Marv Albert, not as part of a duo or a team. It was Marv Albert by himself, mm. broadcasting games. Uh, first, it was on WHN, and and really the way I followed most of the games back then was sitting in my bedroom with my clock radio, <laughs> and listening to Marv, and so he's providing the play-by-play, -play and the color commentary, you know, all in one fell swoop. Mm. And he was a phenomenal announcer because he captured all the action. You, you could just visualize it so easily. But at the same time, he captured the emotion of the game. And while, you know, he was a homer in some respects, you know, obviously he, he got excited by the team. Yeah. He also, you know, could be very objective in describing the action. So, um, uh, you know, I say to people that growing up in the 60s, is very lucky to have grown up with the music of that era because there were so many great musicians and bands and groups, you know, starting with the Beatles, obviously, but a whole eclectic uh, range of music. Um, but I say what the Beatles, what the Beatles were to, to, to 60s pop music, to me, more of Albert was, was and is the basketball announcers. Where were you when, when Willis came out the tunnel in game seven? 
So um, again, showing the sign of the times, the game was not televised live, believe it or not, on ABC in New York City. They did a tape delay after the game of 11 o'clock. The only way you could hear it in New York City was Marv's call of the game on, on the radio. But being out in Westport, we could get the ABC affiliate from New Haven, uh, which was Channel 8, to see the game live. And I went to a friend's house, uh, Bob Powers, uh, still a friend to, to this day, another friend, Car uh, Carter Combe, who unfortunately passed on, uh, and, and, and a fourth friend, uh, Dan Wogue. And we all watched the game at Bob's house. And, uh, but to pay homage to Marv, we actually turned down the TV sound and Turn had the, the picture on the TV, <laughs> but listened to Marv on the radio. Nice, and that was nice. great. It was the best of both worlds. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely, man. Now, uh, how about Clyde's Game 7 performance? You know, 36 points, 19 assists. Uh, what, what was, uh, who was Clyde to you during that whole run, you know, when, when he was with the Knicks? Well, Clyde, I... Um, I'm not that tall. I, I only grew to be, you know, between 5'9 and 5'10. Mm. And for many years, I was really tiny. Uh, so I was a guard uh, and I was a point guard. Uh, well, I can't remember if they had that expression, but I like to pass the ball. Yeah. Um, and so Clyde was the one who inspired me as a guard uh, because, but, but the main way he inspired me actually was I also was a soccer player. And I had the good fortune of playing varsity soccer in high school, uh, then in college. Mm. And, you know, one of the things that our coaches always talked about would be about playing with controlled emotions, uh, not letting a bad call bother you in any way. You know, sometimes you're going to have a bad play. Don't let it go to your head. Be calm. Be cool. And while Clyde was known as, uh, as you know, the king of cool off the court, and there was no way I would ever hope to emulate him in terms of fashion or, uh, you know, the, the, his social life. Right. Um, one thing I did try to emulate was he had the, the calmest demeanor of any athlete I could ever recall. Mm. He just had a very placid exterior, whether the Knicks were up by uh, 15 points or whether they were down by 15 points, you would never know looking at him. Mm. He never got a technical call and he really was the, you know, the paradigm of playing with controlled emotions. And the only player I think that, that you would have seen that maybe you can get some sense of that was, you know, if you watched Alan Houston's game, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, he was really cool, calm and collected. And I, uh, and I know his dad was a coach. So I'm sure his dad probably really instilled it in him about, you know, keeping a, an even keel. So that's another way that Clyde, you know, really inspired me. Very uh, by the way, mm -hmm. Just to tell you, though, in terms of what I consider bad fans, um, and when I say bad fans, I see I have never booed at a game in my entire life, not once, mm -hmm. uh, because I feel there is no justification unless you're absolutely convinced that the players are dogging, dogging it in some yeah, way, yeah. you know, really not hustling. And how could you ever know that for sure? So right. I've never, uh, believe it or not, during a playoff game in 1974, mm -hmm. there were Knicks fans booing Clyde because he was mm -hmm. having a bad game. And to me, that's inexcusable. You know, I, I'm, I'm not here to tell the majority of the fans, but, you know, whatever fans are doing that, I, those to me are not true fans. Um, so. It's interesting. Yeah, it goes all the way back. So Clyde understands, you know, it's just the heaviest jersey in the league and it goes that far back. Very interesting. Now let, let's go into some of your favorite uh, favorites and, and favorite moments. Was that, is that 70 team your favorite team of all time? Well, um, to me, I, 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 it's got to be a tie between the 70 and the 73 championship teams because they both won championships. Um, as you know, uh, the 70 and 73 teams uh, had four, four of the same starters mm -hmm. in, in, in uh, DeBusher and Bradley and, and Reed and Frazier. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, each team had different guys contributing off the bench or a different fifth starter uh, in, in the – 70 team, it was uh, Dick Barnett. Barnett yeah. uh, 70, 73 was the Pearl. The Pearl yeah. And then, you know, you also had, uh, for the 73 team, you had Jerry Lucas mm -hmm. and Phil Jackson Phil. and Dean the Dream Manager coming off the bench. And in 70, you had uh, Mike Reardon and, and Dave Stallworth and, and Nate Bowman being part of what were known as the Minutemen. Mm -hmm. And so you embraced them all. 
you know, one, one of the things that I loved about those teams is not only just the style that they played, but they had a bunch of great personalities and players that we all could embrace. And let's face it, you can look at some other teams and, and I won't name names, but uh, <laughs> yeah, there, 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 there are some knuckleheads out there that you're thinking, part of you saying, geez, I wish he'd come to New York. And the other hand, I'm thinking there's a part of me that's glad he yeah. didn't come to New York. Oh, 100%. And, uh, I won't say uh, Brooklyn, but, uh, <laughs> but, but I think you know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, no, wholeheartedly, man, wholeheartedly. Uh, your favorite player, favorite Nick of all time. So it's, it's, it's a tie between Clyde and Willis. Okay. Uh, Clyde, uh, because as, as I said, just for his style of play and and he always just he brought it every night and just excelled in so many areas of the on both offense and defense Mm -hmm. and willis did as well and i think one of the really sad things in a way is willis is remembered for coming out game seven i mean which is a great thing to be remembered for that Mm -hmm. courageous moment but the fact of the matter is his career was already being uh, impaired by injuries he started to suffer during the middle of that year. Mm. And after that 70 finals, he wasn't quite the same. He missed a lot of time. You got to remember, he was only 27 years old mm. playing in the 1970 finals. And like Bernard King, um, we, we, we lost two players basically in their prime whose careers were significantly impacted. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I mean, not by minor injuries, but by major injuries. And I don't think because there's not a lot of footage out there, people don't know just how good he was. Mm. The combination of quickness and strength. And Willis was really a part of the Knicks prototype or model for what was to come years later. And by that, I mean, traditionally back then they had big men down low. Uh, And Willis could play down low. He had a great post-up game, but he could go outside. And the Knicks had you know, smaller, more mobile centers could go outside. You had five guys who could take the outside shot, who could be called upon to hit the outside shot. And uh, to me, they were the prototype of what was to come in terms of, and this was before the three-point line, by the way. Mm -hmm. Um, So it would be both Willis and Clyde, a a tie. And it's interesting when you say that, because as you say, some people look at that 70s team as kind of that prototype for the modern NBA. So sometimes you think the game has changed so much and then you go back in history and see that, well, maybe 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 not so much in terms of style, more so maybe in terms of, you know, player size and physique and and speed and and so forth. But uh, in terms of the actual, you know, style of a team, the the Knicks kind of had that modern look with Willis being able to stretch the floor a little bit. Absolutely. And, you know, one stat that really tells it all, uh, which I've never seen duplicated, I, you know, I looked to look, but in the 1973 NBA finals, um, in each of the games that the Knicks won, each of the four games, they had a different leading scorer, mm-hmm. uh, Bill Bradley, Dave DeBrusher, Willis Reed, and Earl Monroe. But none of those guys was the Knicks leading scorer in the regular season, mm-hmm. which was, of course, Walt Frazier. And Walt Frazier had, it's not that he was injured in the finals. He was there. He was playing fine. But the fact of the matter is any guy in that starting lineup could be the leading scorer on a given night. And you name me one other team that you could think of in NBA history and all the years you've been watching yeah. where, where any one of the five starters could be the, the leading scorer on a given night and you would not be surprised. But it was the balance of that team. It was the unselfishness of that team. And uh, that's that it's it's perfectly represented in that in that statistic. Team Bull, yeah, personified for sure. Uh, you, you mentioned Bernard King. You had you were season ticket holder from from eighty seven. Uh, did you know were were you seeing many King games live? Did or yes, I, I not a lot, but I would go go to you know two three four games a year uh, before that. Um, but but. The greatest game I saw by Bernard was in the 1984 playoffs. And and some of your uh, viewers might remember uh, in that game, uh, in that series against the Pistons, the five game series, he averaged over 40 points a game. And he wasn't doing this with with three point shots. I mean, he was doing it with an array of shots, you know, inside, mid range, you name it. But on uh, game three at the Garden in 1984, 
Bernard set a, a, a scoring record for the New Garden with 46 points. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. Everyone marvels at Walt, Fra you mentioned it, Walt Frazier's game seven mm -hmm. performance in 1970, and it was mind boggling. He was 12 for 17 from the field. Well, imagine going 12 for 17 from the field, and then on top of that, going seven for 10 from the floor. That's what Bernard King did on that day mm -hmm. in game three. He was 19 for 27 wow. from the floor. And um, I, I, you've probably seen some of the highlights. He would get the ball, you know, uh, maybe on the baseline, and it would be like one singular motion where he would ca catch it, you know, sw turn around. It was, it was so quick, no one could stop him. Yeah. And, you know, the legendary Red Holzman called him the greatest scoring machine he had ever seen. Wow. And his field goal percentage was up around 57%. And again, like Willis Reed, you know, that following year, he was only 28 years old mm. and he went down with that devastating knee injury. Mm. And, um, you know, to me, from my Mount Rushmore, the four greatest Knicks, regardless of the period of time they played, mm -hmm. and I'm talking about the Knicks I've seen. Mm -hmm. I can't really comment on the guys in the 50s, but it's, it's Clyde, it's Willis, it's Patrick, and it's Bernard. Because mm -hmm. even for that window, short window of time, Bernard King was just so outstanding. And, you know, I can only think of what might have been if Patrick yeah. had been able to team up with Bernard. It's crazy, man. Is that the biggest what if? I mean, we the Knicks we were so full of what ifs, right? The injuries and the guys we could have signed and the guys we we did sign to to major mistake of the trades that we did or didn't make. It is is yeah. Bernard and Patrick teaming up and maybe being the the best duo since Clyde and Willis, the biggest what if in Knicks history. Definitely one of them. I, I would say another one, and this is purely from a personal standpoint, because yeah. uh, my, my brother was at school with uh, uh, overlap with Julius Irving. Okay. And, and I actually learned about Julius Irving because my brother's uh, varsity soccer coach was Julius Irving's freshman, freshman uh, basketball coach. Got it. Got it. So Julius Irving. The UMass. Um, Ju pardon me? At UMass, right? Yeah, you may. Yeah, okay, okay, got it. So here, here's one of the biggest what ifs. Julius Irving could have come to the Knicks yeah. at the time of the NBA ABA merger if the Knicks were willing to accept it for just cold cash in lieu of some of what they were supposed to receive for uh, you know payments as yeah. part of the merger. But the Knicks turned it down. They turned down Julius. They turned Irving. down oh Julius God. Irving. Oof. Oh my God. Can <laughs> but the other biggest what if uh, for me, well, but also for a whole generation of Knicks fans, yeah. what if Hakeem had just been a, Oof, just a sliver just of a, a step behind? Just a step behind. What, what, what if John Starks had hit that three pointer? I mean, think about this. The Knicks win a championship. I mean, number one, most importantly. But number two, John Starks scores 19 points in the fourth quarter, including a buzzer beater yeah. three to have the greatest clutch performance in a game in an in NBA Finals history. There's no game seven. Um, I think of how everything would have changed. Yeah. So that that's probably it for me. 100%. Now, from 73 to 94, you have 21 years since the team had been to the finals. What was that? What was your emotions after game seven of 94 when, when the championship is right there? And it slips out of our hands. I know you might think this sounds crazy, but but again, you know, we as fans have different experiences. Yeah. Obviously, I felt terrible, but yeah. I the worst experience I had as a fan, uh, and, and 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 this was being even at the garden. I was mm -hmm. there at my end of the floor. It was mm -hmm. the quote unquote Charles Smith game. Ooh, and by the way, yes. I don't blame Charles because he was in the in the mix of things. Um, but I felt that was our year. You know, 93, um, they, they, you know, there went up two games to nothing. And what a lot of people forget, by the way, is that game three in Chicago, uh, Michael Jordan went something like three for 18 or three for 17. Yeah. Um, which everyone for everyone who thinks, God, this guy is always clutch. He wasn't always clutch. He had his you know, share of bad <laughs> games. And in game five, you know, the Knicks went 20 for 35 from the free throw line. It still it still kills me to this oh. day. And, and my mom, who's, who's almost 94 and, and still going strong and big Knicks fan, wow. she, would, when she would be my guest at games, you know, and 
she would say, uh, if she were an assistant coach, she would just have them work on foul shooting, foul shooting, foul shooting. And that's why I've said that if my mom were an assistant coach under Pat Riley, I'm pretty <laughs> convinced they, they, the Knicks would have won a title. Because uh, they wouldn't have gone twenty for Man. thirty-five that day. So yeah, so you th- so you think that the ninety-three series was was a worse moment to you than, than losing ninety-four? It was wow. and for just right at that moment. Yes, ninety-four was so close. But I feel they didn't. Sh- and even though John went two for eighteen or whatever in Game Seven, I feel they didn't shoot themselves in the foot the way they did by going twenty for thirty-five in a critical game that was all theirs, Oof. man. It was theirs. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that, that's man. It, it it's. Painful even going back and thinking about it, man. Um, what's the best game you've seen live? The most memorable game for me live remains uh, the double overtime game against the Boston Celtics in game four of the 1973 Eastern Conference Finals. Mm. And part of that has to do with the fact that growing up in the 60s, we hated the Celtics. I mean, you know, I think whom you really despise, it, it depends on when you grew up. And back then, the Celtics were winning all those titles, but it was beyond that. Red Auerbach, their coach, would light up this victory cigar, you know, it's the game. And, and it went against everything we were taught as kids about being gracious winners. I mean, it was so annoying. And the Knicks, at one point in the mid-60s, they lost something like 21 games in a row to the Celtics. Mm. So, you know, we grew to despise them. And, and these playoff battles got really heated. So the fact that also is that the Knicks came back from a 16-point deficit at the end of the third quarter, which for many years remained the largest comeback in NBA history uh, for uh, a rally in the playoffs. So um, Clyde Clyde went for 37 points. He was 15 for 30 from the floor. Uh, the great thing, too, is the, the Knicks, Red Holtzman used two seldom used subs, uh, John Gianelli and Henry Bibby in the, in the overtime because people had been fouling out in the second overtime. And, and John Gianelli came up with a couple of key blocks and uh, rebounds, and uh, you know, as as John Andres would say, uh, you know, he was the man of the moment. So Johnny Hoops, yeah, that remains uh, as sweet. Oh, and plus, uh, Phil Jackson had to hit a, two free throws near the end of the first regulation nice. just to push it into overtime. Interesting stuff, man. And now, how about on the road? What was you know the best or the most memorable experience you've uh, I, you've seen on the road? I, I have not been to too many road games, but probably mm-hmm. the most memorable was uh, I always wanted to go to Chicago Stadium because mm-hmm. it had this reputation as a great venue. And uh, my wife uh, graciously agreed on short notice to go out for an anniversary weekend <laughs> for uh, a playoff game there. I was able to get tickets at, uh, at face value through Ticketmaster on a late release. And uh, the Knicks didn't win the game, although they won that series. So that's probably why I have a favorable memory. Mm-hmm. But Chicago Stadium was an awesome arena to see a game in. It was loud. Mm. Uh, the crowd was really into it. To me, it was every bit the equal in the garden. What is your most prized possession, memorabilia, when it comes to the Knicks? Or, or you know, um, sentimental or whatever. Yeah, what was your most, your most prized possession? Probably a tie between a couple things. Uh, the... Um, I still have my ticket stub from the uh, game three of the 1973 uh, NBA finals. Mm. Uh, So, you know, it's always something you cherish when you've actually been there for part of a, uh, a championship Uh, and having that playoff program from 1973 from the finals. Um, The autographs that I still have from when Art Heyman was the Knicks number one draft choice (laughs) that I got the Maurice Stokes benefit game. And it's right in between. I got Art Heyman's right in between Jerry Lucas and Will Chamberlain. So uh, that that that's uh, you know uh, among my most prized possessions too. That's very interesting, man. Very interesting. Well, Fred, I thought, like I said, the memoir was fantastic, and what I really liked about it was that you know as as uh, you go along, you, you pinpoint the, the times in your life that coincide with with the Nick moment, but also those days that that I missed. You know, those the seventy glory days, Bernard King, so on and so forth. Just the stories that you told, you could really put yourself in your shoes. You know, as you're making the trip down to the city and and getting to the game, I, I thought it was very interesting, man. It was it was a really good book. Came out great. It was a great idea by you. Perfect, perfect timing in terms of putting that together. So great job by you and, and my guys at the Strickland for really putting this together. Well, thank you so much for your praise. And as you know, it's a labor of love. And uh, yeah, it's all for a good cause. So uh, and, and as you've seen, we've been generating some uh, very favorable 
uh, reviews and press coverage. So we're very pleased about that, uh, the Strickland and I. So thank you for your kind words. All right. Once again, the book is called Fred from Fresh Meadows, uh, Nick's memoir. Make sure you guys get it from Amazon. The link is in the video description below. Fred, thanks again. Maybe part two, we'll do uh, maybe we'll do a fan cave tour and take a look at some of your memorabilia as well, man. But I definitely appreciate the time. Great book and congratulations. CP, thank you again. Really appreciate being here. All righty. Take care. Bye-bye.